uh, thank you very much for your patience as we have sorted out uh, various technical issues. This seems to be uh, a refrain in the era of Zoom. <laughs> so thank you for your patience and thank you very much, uh, more important for your presence. I'm Deborah McDowell and I am the director of the Carter G. Woodson Institute. Uh, and we welcome you this afternoon to this panel, which we have been greatly anticipating uh, any occasion that allows us to recall our former colleague and friend Julian Bond uh, is indeed a, a, a bittersweet uh, occasion, but uh, we are very happy that the what brings us here this afternoon is the publication of a book that began with his lectures. Uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists and then recede. Uh, Kevin Gaines is the moderator for this afternoon. Uh, Kevin is the Julian Bunn Professor of Civil Rights and Social Justice with a joint appointment in the Corcoran Department of History and the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. The new professorship was created to honor the legacy of Julian Bond, the civil rights champion and former University of Virginia professor. Gaines's current book project is tentatively titled Reconstructing Blackness, the World the Civil Rights Movement Made. He is author of Uplifting the Race, Black Leadership, Politics and Culture during the 20th Century, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 1996. That book was awarded the American Studies Association's John Hope Franklin Book Prize. His second book, American Africans in Ghana, Black Expatriates and the Civil Rights Era, UNC Press 2006, was a choice outstanding academic title. Professor Gaines is the past president of the American Studies Association from 2009 to 2010. Our second panelist is Pamela Horowitz. A native of Minnesota, Pamela graduated from McAllister College with a degree in economics. She then earned a JD from Boston University. As a newly minted lawyer, she was one of the first staff lawyers hired by the Southern Poverty Law Center. A native of Minnesota, oh, I've already said that, she um, <laughs> excuse me, um, she was one of the first staff lawyers hired by the Southern Poverty Law Center joining the Montgomery, Alabama-based organization in 1974. During her time at the center, she successfully argued a landmark gender discrimination case before the U.S. Supreme Court and won many other cases in lower federal courts. She moved to Washington, D.C. in 1977 to become a legislative counsel with the National ACLU and then entered private practice where she remained for the next 25 years. She also worked in partnership with her late husband, Julian Bond, on multiple public, private, and academic projects, including an annual civil rights tour of the South and projects involving the NAACP and the Southern Poverty Law Center. She currently serves on the boards of the NAACP Voter Fund and the SPLC. Jeannie Theo Harris is Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York and the author or co-author of 11 books and numerous articles on the civil rights and black power movements, the politics of race and education, social welfare, and civil rights in post 9-11 America. Her widely acclaimed biography, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, won a 2014 NAACP Image Award and the Letitia Woods Brown Award from the Association of Black Women Historians. Her more recent book, A More Beautiful and Terrible History, 
the uses and misuses of civil rights history. Won the 2018 Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize in nonfiction. While she was an undergraduate at Harvard, she took Julian Bond's class on the civil rights movement. And then two years later, served as his TA. We welcome all of you and we look forward to your discussion of Julian Bond, A Time to Teach. Kevin, I turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Deborah. I, I'd like to thank the Carter G. Woodson Institute for organizing this event. And, and also I'd like to thank James Perla for his technical support. And thanks to all of you who have joined us uh, this afternoon. And I wanna urge you all to send in uh, your questions during the discussion. Um, I believe there's a, a Q&A uh, uh, function or, or, or chat. So James, hopefully you, uh, you can um, help with uh, fielding those questions. We really want to uh, introduce those to the discussion. So it's a pleasure for me to serve as moderator for this uh, discussion of the newly released book, Julian Bond's, a Julian Bond's Time to Teach, A History of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And um, as Deborah mentioned earlier, this book was compiled from Julian Bond's lectures from his legendary course on the US Civil Rights Movement that he taught at UVA for 25 years to some 5,000 students. And the book was edited by my fellow panelists, Pam Horowitz and Jeannie Theo Harris. And I wanna thank both of them for uh, this incredible contribution for bringing out uh, Julian Bond's lectures and crafting them into this powerful and uh, quite comprehensive narrative history of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. So over the next hour and a half, we look forward to um, uh, a discussion of the book, uh, fairly wide ranging, uh, a discussion of the book of Julian Bond's uh, life and legacy and the lessons that we can draw from this account of the movement by, uh, you know, the lessons that today's activists can draw from this account of the movement. And this is really no ordinary history of the civil rights movement. Julian Bond was a teacher and a scholar, but his insights into the movement are all the more invaluable and authoritative because he was a longtime activist in the movement with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, also, uh, well, more commonly known as SNCC. And so Julian Bond was an eyewitness to many of the events that he chronicles here and a close associate of many other uh, people in the movement uh, who like him were legendary uh, activists. Now I teach a course on the history of the civil rights movement uh, here at UVA. And so um, it's just really exciting to know that his interpretation of that period uh, is now available and, uh, and, and has been documented. Um, and so current events really prove without a doubt that uh, the time for this book is now uh, and it is definitely a time to teach the history of the movement. So it's really fitting that we have this discussion of Julian Bond's work during Black History Month. And really, uh, we, we have to say at a time when American democracy is under serious threat. So um, having said that, let's jump right into the discussion. Um, Pam, we could spend a lot of time talking about Julian Bond's incredible life of activism politics, civil and human rights leadership, teaching. Um, you know, in fact, Julian Bond's name came up last week during the impeachment trial of the former president when his lawyers, the, pres the former president's lawyers, disingenuously invoked the case of Bond v. Floyd in which the Supreme Court ruled that the Georgia State Legislature had violated uh, Bond's rights under the First Amendment in banning him from assuming the office in the Georgia State Legislature that he had been elected to. And the head of the House uh, impeachment managers, uh, Representative Jamie Raskin, forcefully rebuked uh, the former president's lawyers calling Julian Bond a civil rights hero. And Raskin stated that associating Bond's case with uh, the defense of the president's incitement of insurrection was a desecration. 
So the controversy over Bond's uh, fight to be seated in the office uh, that he was elected to uh, made him a national figure. Uh, in 1968, he was the first African-American to be nominated as vice president. And so Julian Bond's contribution to American public life is vast and his legacy is still very much with us. Um, so um, I, I'll, I'll just add uh, briefly that I remember doing research in, in the papers of Julian Bond's father, the educator Horace Mann Bond, and uh, reading in the correspondence uh, of the father's uh, praise and pride for uh, his, his son's uh, activities. So, um, Pam, I'm sure that many in, in our audience know a fair amount about Julian Bond, but for those who may not, could you tell us who he was? Uh, tell us some of his accomplishments and anything else that you would like us to know about him? Sure, uh, let, let me first thank you, Kevin, for being here. Um, it's wonderful that you are the first occupant of Julian's chair and you certainly do him proud. And Professor McDowell, thank you for organizing this and more broadly for being Julian's friend in life and a keeper of his legacy in death. Uh, and let me also mention that uh, Jean and I had an able assistant in a research assistant who was a student of, of Jean's uh, named Eric Wallenberg. And the Julian's papers are at UVA and it was Eric who was first, the first to delve into the papers uh, in order to bring this book to fruition. Uh, so I also, and he said that the small librarians were a great help to him. And for people who are not familiar, I don't mean that the librarians are tiny. I, it, the, sm the library is called the small library uh, after its benefactor. And so a, a, a shout out to them too, because uh, the book was made, the book is Julian's words and it was, we wouldn't have had the words had we not been, been able to get them from, from the library. Um, I often start, when people ask me about Julian, I often start uh, at the end because I think it helps to understand who he was. Uh, Julian did not want a tombstone, he wanted a bench. And on one side, he wanted it to say race man, which he considered himself to be in the model of W.E.B. Du Bois, and Frederick Douglass, uh, and in which uh, he spent his life. But on the other side, he wanted it to say easily amused uh, because he had a wonderful sense of humor. And I think that is what allowed him to do the serious work of being a race man. Uh, and Kevin, you raised the, the fact that Bond v. Floyd became a part of the impeachment proceedings, uh, Julian Bond for the defense. And I think he would have been amused by the defense's attempt to use that case, which was clearly irrelevant. And they seemed not to really know exactly what it was about when they first introduced it in oral argument, the lawyer said that it was about draft card burning, which of course it wasn't. It was about SNCC's anti-war statement, uh, which didn't mention draft card burning. Julian didn't burn his draft card. Uh, but, but for me, it became the highlight of the proceedings when Jamie Raskin uh, so nicely paid homage, not just to Julian, but also to uh, SNCC and, and other members of SNCC. Um, and as you noted, that really started, Julian came into the movement uh, in February of 1960 uh, in response to the Greensboro sit-ins. He was a student at Morehouse uh, and a fellow student said, why don't we do this and here? And Julian always told the story as uh, before I could say, what do you mean we? They were organizing the, the room where the, in, a, in a drugstore where they were. And that was the beginning of the Atlanta movement. And that was the beginning of Julian's life in the civil rights movement. Um, he then became a founder of SNCC uh, in uh, 
February and it's served as its communications director for five years. So even though to the disappointment of his students, he was not at every major event that occurred in the movement, but he did know about, it was his job to know and to communicate those events. Um, then a decision was made after a debate in SNCC, which debated everything, that Julian should run for office. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a given because as is still the case, uh, you know, activists have to decide whether or not they're gonna work from within or whether that's somehow a sellout and not something that they should be doing. And, but they decided that he should run. It was really a group-based decision. Uh, and then as it turned out, he had to be elected three times before he was allowed to take his seat thanks to the Supreme Court decision in Bond v. Floyd. And uh, that having made him a household name led to, as you said, Kevin, his nomination uh, for vice president. And he would spend 20 years basically as, a, as an elected official. And then his, his midlife career change was to academia, where because his father was a college president, he never intended to be and didn't think that he was going to like academia. So at the beginning, uh, which was the late 1980s, it was sort of have syllabus will travel. And he taught at different schools, Harvard, Penn, Williams, Drexel. But then he landed at UVA and that became his home for the next 20 plus years. Uh, and while Julian was still teaching, uh, Jean, who, as it's been noted, was, was Julian's student and then his TA at Harvard, and that was many years ago and became our, so she became our friend of long standing. And we were at dinner one night, the three of us, and she said to Julian, would you consider doing a book with me on the teaching of civil rights history? And Julian said, in typical Julian fashion, um, why don't you ask me after I've retired and you should know that I don't want to do a lot of work. And so that was the end of the discussion with him as it turned out. And then Jean asked me, uh, and, and I, I think that it's just a stroke of luck that the book is coming out now. Um, you know, we could have done it sooner. We never thought that it was time sensitive because this material is timeless and hopefully not only is it resonant now with what's happening, but it will continue to be for the next many decades because of the centrality of race in our country's history and in our in Americans' lives. Um, but but I think it, it has also worked out to the book's advantage that it come out now, um, because I do think that you know whether not sure that it's a that's a it's a movement, but I think it's more than a moment. And I think, I think people are much more conscious of the role that race plays. And I, I, I think it's interesting, you know, there are at least five states where lawmakers are attempting to uh, restrict the teaching of civil rights history. And that tells you that it must be very important and they must be very afraid that people will learn it because they care enough to stop it. Uh, so Jean, I don't know, do you wanna pick up on how, we were able to do this because Julian's lectures are written down, were written down in full sentences. Uh, and, and Jean allows me to tell that when she was, she did not know when she was taking Julian's course that he was reading his lectures. That's how smooth his delivery was. Um, and you know, he was, a, he was kind of the narrator in chief of the civil rights movement. He narrated Eyes on the Prize and several other documentaries. Um, so he could, and, and he had, because of his uh, becoming a, a household name as a result of, of being nominated, the, the war, the anti-war statement and then being nominated 
uh, vice president. He gave a lot of lectures around the country for his, his really his entire political career and, and thereafter. Um, so he knew how to deliver a speech or a lecture. Um, so Gene, do you wanna, wanna pick up on how we actually, you, your realization that they were written down and what that meant for the book? Right, well, I mean, I think as many people on this call probably know, it's not typical that people write out their lectures in full, beautiful sentences, right? If there'd be no way that somebody could publish a book of my lectures just because they're just like bullet points and notes. And, um, and then one of the things that um, Julian did was not just write his lectures out, but constantly polish them and add new things uh, because part of what is in some ways exceptional and, and in some ways rare about the book is that it's both um, a movement memoir in that he's, he, he's at many of these events, he's the communications director of SNAG, so he has firsthand knowledge of many of the things he's lecturing. But, you know, but this is not Julian Bond's autobiography because in many ways, Julian, as much as he might have originally not thought he wanted to be in academia, he, Julian was a scholar in many ways. And so one of the things that the lectures reflect is the decades of scholarship on the civil rights movement that have kind of come out in the past, you know, and he's constantly revising them. And so it's a really rare kind of book because it in some ways combines both of those two. Um, and, and we were, I mean, I had, I had discovered it when I was working on the Rosa Parks book because I, I was watching a video of Julian looking for some detail about the Montgomery bus boycott. And all of a sudden I was like, he's reading all of this. Like he's not just looking at notes, he's reading. And then a couple months after he died, I woke up one morning and I was like, I think I need to email Pam. I wonder if these exist in the world, like if these exist and then they did exist. Um, and so it's, I mean, we're very lucky because certainly I know that one of the things I was very sad about um, when Julian died was just that the learning from him would be over, right? And that so many people, myself included, but so many people I know had, had, had learned so much and in many ways had started on the, the journey to their career in part through, their, through taking that class. Uh, and I think one of the real gifts of the book is that the learning can continue. Thank you. Uh... To, to both of you, I mean, that's, that's really um, uh, very, very uh, in, informative and wonderful. I, I mean, when I was reading the book, and I, you know, I, I have, uh, obviously, as many people do, a very strong memory of, of hearing uh, uh, Julian Bond's narration of the Eyes on the Prize series. And so, um, as reading the book, um, you, you could almost hear <laughs> the voice. Yeah, you can hear it. Um, and and um, it, it is really uh, just just a, a a wonderful experience and and uh, and incredibly insightful. Um, uh, Gene, your point about how his his account is is very much steeped in scholarship of the civil rights movement. Um, you know, certainly certainly bears out in in, in the reading of the book. Um, Gene, what was it like to have? Uh, Julian Bond as a teacher and a mentor. You talked about how the lectures were so well crafted, and and I think Pam, you mentioned this too. His his very very sort of skilled delivery um, made it uh, uh, difficult to detect that he was actually reading the lectures. But what was it like to have him as a teacher and and later as a mentor? Um, you also yeah. sort of uh, you worked with him as a, a teaching assistant. Right, right. So I think so. And I write about this in the introduction, like one of my most indelible memories of taking the class, um, and I was a junior, um, is sort of in the first, like, it's not the first lecture, but very early on in the class, right? We get to the Montgomery bus boycott, and then it's days on the Montgomery bus boycott. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, we're never, you know, how are we even gonna get to the 1960s at this pace, right? And we start back in the 1930s and 40s and then there's all of these different people. And then you get to December 1st, 1955 and we're literally going hour by hour. Um, and what I realized later, and I think part of what is so kind of indelible about the way he taught the class and certainly has shaped the way I now write about the civil rights movement is is how much he showed us the how it worked, 
right? But in the kind of master narrative, and he in many ways was part of the goal of the class was to overturn that master narrative, right? To, to, to sort of show the ways that we were talking about the civil rights movement was narrow and distorted and wrong in many ways. Um, and one of the parts of that master narrative that was so very wrong is just, it tends to be like Rosa Parks sits down and somehow people rise up and then, you know, King is the leader and then the Montgomery bus boycott succeeds, right? And it sort of puts the movement on a pedestal and you can't even really imagine how it happened. So you certainly can't imagine how you would do it again. Um, and part of that days of talking through the Montgomery bus boycott was about how they did it and how all the different people, right? So it takes it away from like one or two leaders, right? One or two events. Um, it, you know, when you see again, like in the evening hours of December 1st and the morning of December 2nd, right? Of, you know, Rosa Parks makes the decision late December 1st that she's willing to pursue a legal case. She calls a young lawyer by the name of Fred Gray. Fred Gray calls the head of the Women's Political Council, Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson sneaks into Alabama State College where she teaches and with the help of two students runs off 50,000 leaflets. She calls Edie Nixon, who's one of the most militant activists in Montgomery in the middle of the night. He gets on the phone with the more political minister. Right? And all of a sudden you start to see how a movement is built, right? So I think part of what he taught me was how, was the kind of importance of, of doing that, of showing how. Um, I think in terms of, of being a mentor, and this happens in some ways later. Um, so we had stayed in touch. Um, and then when I start to work on the Parks biography, we get in much better touch. And I, I do an interview with him. Um, and. And one of the things I was trying to do in my Parks biography was really tell the second half of her life in Detroit, right? To, to sort of, you know, because it, Rosa Parks spends more than half of her life, like outside of the South, fighting the racism of the North. And so we get to this part of the story and he gets very rueful. And he's basically like, I met her so many times. I thought I knew all there was, you know, I thought I knew what I needed to know. And so I didn't ask. Um, and so that's, and then what he set about to do is to, is to sort of open doors for me and ask people and think of people that might be able to give me clues to that second half. And so that taught me a couple of things. The first was how important it is, right? And, and, and to, to admit what we don't know, right? That it's, there's no shame in it. Um, and then the second thing was part of Julian's gift as a mentor was his willingness to kind of step up and do the work, right? So, I mean, he's Julian Bond, anything, like having him write a blurb on your book is like a huge honor. So the notion that he's like writing people, getting interviews. Um, and then when the book comes out, we're out to dinner, they, Pam and Julian had come to see a book talk I did. Um, and we were talking about one part of the book, which is about Rosa Parks' suffering and it's basically this really radical little NAACP chapter in River Rouge made up of communist auto workers that shames the national office into helping Rosa Parks in 1960. Her, she's been in the hospital, the bill has gone into collections. They're so very poor. And it's at this moment, I see the, you know, the wheels in Julian's mind turning and he's like, you need to tell this to the whole NAACP executive board. And then he made it happen. And in, in some ways, Part of that was the what we could, we could, what we can see in the book and and what we can see across his life is that people don't people need the history how to say this we need hard history right and Hassan Jeffries uses this phrase of hard history right that that we can't just have the history that makes us comfortable we can't just have the history that like shows us in our better light right and so there he was making sure that the NAACP got to hear this history of Rosa Parks, but part of that history was, was hard. Um, and so I think that gives me a lot as a mentor. And I think finally, he, so many, I mean, obviously we are all so busy. And I think one of the ways that we tend to sort of move through that is to tell everybody how busy we are. And Julian, one of Julian's greatest gifts to me was that he just, he didn't do that. And he modeled not doing that. Right. And that he would just, you know, he would write you back immediately. He would, you know, if, if he had something to help, he would help. 
right? And he didn't constantly remind you that he was so busy, even though he was like so busy and he was Julian Bond, but, and it was a real model to me on how to move through sort of being a mentor myself. And, you know, if I could add just one thing, I, I think I've thought about Julian as a teacher and I, th and I think he really identified with his students because he was talking about and teaching about a time when he was like them. He was a college student when he entered the movement and all of the people in SNCC were college students or people who had left college. Julian ended up dropping out with one semester to go, which you can imagine didn't set too well with his parents, although he did eventually get his degree. But I, I think that he, that, that for, for one thing had the effect of making students feel that, and, and Jean alluded to this when she was talking about how, how he taught them or, or rejected the master narrative, making them feel they could do it. In, in, my, in my forward, I quote one of them that I, that I emailed for this purpose who said, I left class each week feeling empowered, not only by the actions of those who came before me, but also in my own ability to make meaningful contributions to civil rights. And so I think that that's one of the reasons that the book is important uh, in, in terms of, of people having a chance to read it because it is, it is not at all a how to do it manual because neither Julian nor anyone else in SNCC would presume to tell people who came after them how to make a movement. But you understand how they did it and you come away knowing, I think that you can do it. And so in some ways uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message of hope. And I think that's what Julian would want people to take away from it because you know, there, there can't be change without hope. And we certainly know we need change. Yeah, I, what, what Bo saying about how the work, your narrative of the movement, movement, you know, we focus on maybe two parks and doc, but you know, that lovely chapter um, and throughout the book, it's almost cinematic the way a, a new significant leader is introduced and there's a nice biographical sketch of that person. And the, the, the biographical of Rosa Parks is, is just incredibly moving, challenging the master that, you know, that she um, was tired and, and didn't give up her seat on the bus in December of 1955. Um, goes into, and of course, uh, Jean, you're, uh, you know, Ruth makes this, uh, this point very, that she, she's a veteran activist. So many veteran activists who were involved in the Montgomery movement, and 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 all of the activists uh, in cases with E.D. Nixon going back all the 1920s. So so there's that sense that the Montgomery movement is uh, has who are making contributions and keeping the movement going, hoping that that. Uh, uh, you all can, can talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the how Julian's work uh, uh, challenged those master narratives, you know. Something that you said earlier, how the civil rights movement hasn't been taught. Um, so this is a really, you know, important, timely. Um, a lot of my students in my course on the civil rights movement say that they're studied it in high school. Really? Or had the opportunity to study the rights movement in high school. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I asked them, you know, on the first day, write out a little mini autobiography.
seem to have lost Kevin. Yes. Yeah. He was I mean, going in and out and freezing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We could start, we could answer the first part of that question um, mm -hmm. in terms of the Montgomery bus boycott and this master narrative and some of the other aspects that I think Julian's work gets us to. Yes. One part so of the sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess what, you know, I have the students ask, tell me why they're taking the class. And what they usually say is that they had not had any opportunity to discuss the civil rights movement in their high school. And we have a discussion about why that might be the case. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really very important that, um, that the work is out and that it challenges the, the master narrative. But in some, the, the students don't even know the master narrative. But I think they do. I mean, I think that the master narrative is now, I would argue, like a story that the United States tells about itself, you know, during Black History Month, during the way that we celebrate King Day, right? The master narrative is under the surface, even if you've not gone to study the civil rights movement at school, right? And it's, and Julian would joke, right? It's like the master narrative is Rosa Parks sits down, King, King stands up, and then the good white people come and save the day, right? That it's sort of, and there's, it's sort of this easy narrative, there's this successful end, and then black power comes along and ruins everything, right? And so I think Julian's complicating a lot of different parts about it, but one part I wanted to kind of focus on is the ways that he talks about how hard and unpopular the civil rights movement was at the time, how much opposition that people encounter, not just from people like Bull Connor, Sheriff Clark, Governor Wallace, right? But that there are a whole host of people standing in the way of the civil rights movement that might have not engaged in violence, but stood on the sidelines when other people did, that might have not yelled at school children, but absolutely worked to make sure that schools stayed segregated. And so I think one of the things that, that Julian did in terms of getting us past the master narrative was showed us not just how the movement happened, but also how white supremacy was constantly maintained and the kind of cast of characters who did so, many of whom didn't see them, you know, were not the Klan, didn't see themselves that way, um, you know, to use King's phrase, the, the role of the white moderate. And I think in many ways, the, the master narrative airbrushes, um, you know, some of that out of the story and it backdates everyone's admiration for the civil rights movement when most Americans did not support the civil rights movement at the time, as we know, right? And many of the students in SNCC faced sort of backlash from their parents, from their, the administration of the colleges they were going to, from, um, from others in the community that might've shared some of the goals, but you know, didn't like their tactics, right? And, and so I think one of the things that was so useful about the class, if we're talking about also how it helped us see the, like where to go from here is, is this idea that you're not necessarily going to be appreciated in the moment, right? You're not, that taking a stand is not, right? Like King, Parks, Snick, right? At the time, right, or not, like it's not like just one warm hug. Um, and I think that's really useful, right? In terms of also understanding a, a kind of harder history of the civil rights movement. Absolutely, I mean, the, the hard history, uh, uh, the, you know, the account in this book is, is far from the triumphalism that you get whenever there's discussion of the civil rights movement and, you know, it's Black History Month. And so, you know, we, we see it as, as this movement where, you know, people were, you know, had courage, but, um, it almost seems as if their success was, uh, um, if you call it that, foreordained. Uh -huh. But you know, it's a, it's a really important corrective to say, you know, to remind us how unpopular the movement was, uh, you know, at the time, how un unpopular Dr. King was. Um, and and you know, another idea that comes through really strongly uh, in in the book is 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 Julian Bond's insistence that the civil rights movement didn't come out of nowhere. And he, he spends a lot of time talking about precursors and origins of the, of the civil rights movement. It, it, it didn't just sort of burst forth all of a sudden. And so there's a lot of emphasis on the historical roots of, of, of the movement. And, and this really, and, and this is another uh, part of the book that was striking for me, 
um, the, the telling examples, the telling cases of how a lot of the people who are active in the movement, um, um, you know, Julian makes the point of talking about their experiences of the daily humiliations of Jim Crow um, and the whole range of experiences from, from that to, you know, um, uh, the, the notorious cases of, of uh, anti-black violence, of white supremacist uh, domestic terrorism with, that was dominant uh, at, at that time. And, uh, you know, he, he goes back and talks about the history of Jim Crow, the Garvey movement, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and so we, we think of the, the 1950s and the Brown decision as this galvanizing moment, but, you know, um, Julian really uh, wants us to, to sort of look back and see that there's the activists, they're not just these young activists. You know, I tell my students that they're, you know, they're the activists in the movement who, who did so much work with their age, if not younger, um, but all the veteran activists, uh, the Rosa Parkses, uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, E.D. Nixon. Um, and, and so it, it seems like Julian was really ahead of the curve in terms of scholarship on the civil rights movement. You know, we now talk about the long civil rights movement, but uh, it, it sounds like that was something that, that he'd been um, telling his classes going back uh, many years now. Yeah, absolutely, right? Like, I think, you know, our generation of scholars, right, starts to talk about the long civil rights movement and, and really flesh out that idea. But I think those of us who got the privilege of, of learning some of this from Julian, like that was an idea that was, you know, that was there all over that class, right? The idea that, that also one of the, one of the more inspiring things about this, right, is you see people doing things, doing things, doing things. Do, I mean, so, you know, obviously I read about this with Parks, but you, there's all sorts of people in the book, right, who are, and then, and then there is a moment when history starts to shift, right? If you think about somebody like Amzie Moore in, in Mississippi or, or E.D. Nixon in Montgomery, or um, if we think about, um, I think who else, you know, people who have been doing this work for years and decades, in, in many ways in the wilderness. And then there's a moment when things start to shift, um, but that you don't get that shift without that kind of spade work, that groundwork. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it almost reminds me of, of the discussions during last summer with the, uh, the, the awakening of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, after you know, the, the uh, uh, killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And people were kind of astonished at how this movement had just sort of burst forth. And, you know, uh, I remember listening to an, uh, an interview with Angela Davis and she was saying that, uh, you know, a lot of people were doing a lot of work behind the scenes that didn't get recognized. And that, you know, the current, you know, awakening is the product of, 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 of that, you know, unsung, uh, uh, work that's been an organizing that's been going on for, for a long time. Um, I, I want to uh, talk uh, and, and I'm hoping that we can share uh, a little bit of, uh, of Julian Bond himself today. Um, Julian Bond was a, a poet. He was a person of, of, of many talents. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, everyone will uh, get the book and understand, uh, uh, you know, directly all of the things we've been saying about what a wonderful book it is and, and, and what a, a really powerful interpretation of the movement is. Um, but um, there was part of the, of, of, uh, the class that you, you all were unable to replicate in the book. Uh, Julian Bond apparently gave a lecture on the freedom music in, in the movement. And he does talk in the book about how um, for SNCC, music was uh, you know, an incredible part of, of their sort of daily work and daily functioning and, uh, and, and organizing. That um, music and the freedom songs um, sung uh, at mass meetings provided a sense of, of spiritual renewal um, and really sort of giving 
the activists in SNCC in, in Mississippi and Georgia, in the deep South really uh, behind the scenes and really in the belly of the beast in terms of Southern uh, Jim Crow uh, gave them a sense of, uh, of rejuvenation and, and, and courage uh, uh, against you know, very, very sort of dangerous and stressful conditions. Um, and so um, I was hoping that, and, 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 you know, and separately in, in uh, Julian speaking about the, the movement, he gave a lecture on um, the popular music of the 1950s as a sort of a cultural force that um, sort of militated against the, the, the sort of the racial boundaries. Um, you know, the popularity of black music during the 1950s of figures like Ray Charles, Little Richard, et cetera, um, really, uh, and particularly the popularity with many white youth uh, in, in the South and in the North, was almost like a sort of a um, advance guard, a cultural uh, counterpart to the cause of civil rights. So if you don't mind, I'd like to share um, a clip of Julian Bond talking about uh, the, the, the music and the culture of the 1960s as a way of uh, talking about how cultural change was experienced uh, by young people in the United States, black and white, north and south. Uh, and so, um, James, uh, it's, it seems like you, uh, you have this. I, I just really felt that it was important for us to, to actually hear uh, from Julian Bond uh, during this event. I don't know why we're having. I'll make Richard a rock star. He becomes the music's premier wild man. It goes to number two on the black charts and number 17 on the pop charts. We had a little taste of, of, of that. Um, I don't know, um, something, something unfortunate happened with the sound there. So um, questions are starting to come in and, and I just want to encourage those of you who are with us to, to uh, share these questions. This is a question from Randolph Moulton. And um, Pam, I, 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 I imagine you, you might be able to, to comment, or, or Jean, Jean too. What was Julian's position on Confederate monuments? Well, you know, he, he had been, uh, the first president of the Southern Poverty Law Center and then a longtime board member. Uh, and, and the center was one of the, the earliest organizations, I think, to start uh, inventorying Confederate monuments and, and working for their disposition. Um, and so Julian would have been in favor, for example, of removing Robert E. Lee from the town square in Charlottesville. Uh, and, you know, it's, complica it's complicated when you start changing names of schools. Um, I think it's complicated if you change the Edmund Pettus Bridge because it 
has a certain iconic uh, place in our culture as, as the Edmund Pettus Pettus Bridge. But, but by and large, I think that uh, Julian would have, would have said that uh, monuments uh, are, are symbolic and symbols matter and uh, they should at least be removed to some place other than the heart of town, like what happened in New Orleans when they, they managed to get them all out of Lee Circle and take them somewhere. I'm not sure anyone even really knows where they are, but if they're in, they can be in some sort of monument field that, that you know, it's like a cemetery, but they shouldn't be front and center in our lives. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Pam. I, I, you know, I, I see these other questions coming in and I, I feel like I should uh, share them. I think they bear on some of the things that we, talk, we spoke about earlier. Um, here's a question from John Grant and uh, Jean, feel free to, to jump in as well. Julian's story is about the intersection of movement politics with electoral politics. What do you think he would say about the current movement politics, Black Lives Matter, uh, and its relation to our current electoral politics? That's a... Uh, well, I, I know for sure, because, you know, Black Lives Matter was around before Julian died, that Julian was an admirer of Black Lives Matter. Um, I think he saw himself in the Black Lives and other SNCC people, um, because there are lots of parallels, I think, between SNCC and the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And... Uh, you know, as I alluded to when the decision before, when I was talking about Julian's decision to run for office, um, you know, sometimes the intersection between uh, political activism and political office is, is complicated and, and one doesn't necessarily lead to the other. Um, but I, I think that uh, we, we need Black Lives Matter and other organizations like that in order to understand what is happening in electoral politics. Because it, it's as masterful a job as I thought, for example, that the, the impeachment managers did, they really stayed away from the racial aspect and, their, and, and, and the insurrection was about race and the, and, the, and the Trump attempt to undermine the election was basically to erase black voters. So like, and that's hardly a surprise. I mean, it's everything in our history, you know, past history and our current lives is, is related to race in this country. Um, so electoral politics is, is certainly no different. And uh, we, you know, we see it in, in the effort to, to wipe out, I mean, voter suppression uh, has been rampant ever since the Supreme Court annihilated the Voting Rights Act, and in, with the with the effort the effort to to undermine Biden's election was was really saying black votes shouldn't count. Not only should we not make should we make it difficult for them to ever vote, but if they have voted, we should throw them out. So, I think we need to under, we need to understand that that's what's what's been happening. I mean, I think another thing is, if we go back to our conversation about the master narrative, I think one of the ways that the master narrative like rears its dangerous head in the present is the kind of false distinction between Black Lives Matter and the civil rights movement and this constant kind of invocation against Black Lives Matter, that they're not doing it the right way, that they should be more like King or be more like the civil rights movement. Um, both not realizing that many of the criticisms of Black Lives Matter are criticisms that were raged against SNCC, against King. Um, that, that this notion of how change happens, right? Again, like the master narrative gives us this like easy idea that like decent people support change when, in, when you raise up an injustice and that's not the history of this country. And so I think one of the things that Black Lives Matter gives us kind of dovetails with one of Julian's central lessons, right? Which is that like, you know, and which is, you know, one of 
Du Bois's central lessons, which is one of Frederick Douglass's, you know, that change doesn't come easy, right? People, you know, um, and so this idea, and again, we, we heard for, you know, former President Obama coming up, you know, this like idea of snappy slogans and you're just like, you know, um, part of what the civil rights movement did was make people very, very uncomfortable and keep them uncomfortable, right? And I think we're seeing Black Lives Matter kind of doing a similar thing, right? And so the danger of, again, this fable we tell of the civil rights movement is I think it makes us feel good about ourselves and the way change happens in this country that is largely ahistorical. Yes, and I think you see that every time somebody says in response to what happened on January 6th and the situation we find ourselves in now, that this is not who we are. As particularly elected politicians are fond of saying, this is not who we are. Well, maybe this is who we are. And if we understand our history, maybe we can become something better. Yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly uh, important to emphasize that, uh, you know, that, that the insurrection was, was long, long in the making and um, the product of decades of political parties using uh, race as a wedge issue, as trying to sort of mobilize electoral support, you know, with voter suppression, with, you know, invoking racial stereotypes, et cetera. Okay, I think you all have begun to answer this question, but there's a question from Pearl Early. Um, you know, Pam, you mentioned voter suppression. Um, which I think is, and, and the sort of the, the, the racial animus of that, which seems to be um, at the heart of this challenge to American democracy right now. The Pearl Early asks, what do you see as the most challenging issues facing the black community today? Um, and a rather enormous and, and challenging question. Well, well, I do think that the restoration of the Voting Rights Act is, is paramount, not just to the black community, but to the country. Uh, and that it is shameful that it, we've had all these years pass since Shelby the County was decided and, and it hasn't happened yet. So as far as a, a, a legislative response, I think that the, that the restoration of the Voting Rights Act is, is the most important thing. But I think the, la the larger issue is the economic disparities, and that's just hard. Um, you know, in many ways, things economically are worse or as bad as they were in the, in, dur during the movement. Um, school segregation is worse than it was when Brown was decided. Um, and so, and that, and that is structural and we, we need to figure out how to fix it. Um, and that means regulating capitalism and we've just had four years of deregulation. Uh, and, that, and, and it probably means uh, raising the minimum wage. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think that some of the struggles that people are going through because of the pandemic has made uh, other people better who are better economically situated understand what, what those people's lives are like and how dependent they are on those people. Um, but, and, and I think as an immediate response, the, the, the bold 1.9 trillion plan, plan is, is necessary. But I think we need we need structural changes to our economic system, and as I say, that's not going to happen overnight. And exactly what those changes should be are, uh, you know, are complicated. And then, of course, there's there's education. And now, now that's all been made worse by the fact that children have been out of school way too long, and a lot of them haven't even been online in poor communities, and so they've lost even more time. Uh, and, and education is, is critical to, you know, any kind of meaningful equality. Thank you, Pam. That was a pretty comprehensive uh, response to, uh, to that uh, very challenging question from Pearl early. There's- oh, thank you. I'm gonna get to one more of these questions that uh, have, have come in. And this is a question from Phyllis Leffler. 
uh, and she says, I remember so well that when Julian was asked by students what they could do today, he simply said, do something, start wherever you can and wherever you want to. And, uh, and, and she goes on to say, I think that was a way to empower young people, to allow them to understand that there was no magic to being an activist. Is that a theme that also came through in his lectures uh, and a way that in which he addressed the civil rights movement itself? There's oh, magic. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, one of probably my favorite chapters in the book is the chapter where we sort of see the sit-ins start to emerge. Um, and, you know, I remember when he, when he starts talking about the sit-ins and, and that, you know, that Greensboro comes first, even though Nashville has been organizing for a while, but Gene Greensboro kind of jumps the queue and these four young men in Greensboro um, basically make this decision. They're tired of people talking about things and they're, you know, and they're friends. They're these four friends and they just make this decision. And that, um, and I remember, you know, it's like, oh, these are just four friends. If you have three friends, you can start. And then of course there's other people. There's the young women at Bennett College, right? They're involved by the second day. You see all these other people. So 17 the first day, I mean, second by the second day, 63 by the third day, right? That, that where it starts isn't necessarily where it goes. And obviously he was also clear that not all of, you know, not every action turns into like a mass movement, right? But that that there were all of these moments where just very small groups of people would just start. And then you're like, oh, I don't have to be like a whole big movement to start. And I think that was, so I think that was one of the, one of the real gifts of the class, right? Was just watching people kind of take action often even before they could see where it could end, right? Um, because I think that's also your, Kevin, you were talking about Rosa Parks. And I think one of the ways that we that he taught Rosa Parks was that if you see her as this longtime activist and then she makes this stand on December 1st, part of what is kind of courageous about that is that she's been making stands before. There's nothing to suggest that making a stand on this day is gonna do something that making a stand two years ago, three years ago, eight years ago. Um, and yet you see people doing these things over and over, right? So I think that's the other thing is that that both where you start, one of the other lessons I think he was so good at kind of sharing is just like what you can imagine changes by being in motion. And so that you don't necessarily have to be able to see the end to start. Right, I mean, everyone, when they think of the civil rights movement, they think of, uh, of leadership, they think of charismatic leadership of someone like Dr. King, who was the ind indispensable figure, but the book seems to be, you know, taking a, a, a very different position and talking about leadership at the local level, at the grassroots level, um, that there wasn't this national movement, well, that the movement had this national dimension, but there were all of these local movements with really extraordinary leaders who are, are, are just not um, as well known. And it's really important to think about, um, you, know, you know, the just the incredible and immense talent and grassroots and local leaders. And my sense is that um, in addition to talking about SNCC and, and really, you know, privileging SNCC as the sort of the, uh, the, the youthful and perhaps radical wing of, of the movement, um, you have this enormous wealth of talent at the local level and grassroots leaders. Um, yeah, uh, Professor Gaines, sorry to interrupt, but on the on the question on the topic of talent, we did have a question come in um, from Allison Richards earlier, um, and if you'd like, I can read read this out. Um, Please do. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, Julian was a multifaceted teacher. While he wasn't an academic at the time, Julian wrote a comic about the Vietnam War, which is featured in the National Museum of African American History. This was long before others we're using comics and graphic novels to communicate in this way. Um, and so she's wondering if maybe Pam, perhaps, or, or Jeannie can comment on this, the graphic novel that Bond wrote, um, the sort of anti-war uh, graphic novel comic that he wrote. Well, it is true that Julian was very proud of it. Uh, and 
I don't know how it got into the museum. I, I have donated Julian's collection of black memorabilia to the museum, but it wasn't it included in that. And the and on display in the museum, it doesn't tell where they got it. Um, but but it's true that it's a that it's a depiction of the, the basically the, the anti-war movement uh, through the use of a comic book. So we can say once again, Julian was in the forefront, even when it came to comic books. Possibly where John Lewis got the inspiration for uh, his, his graph. Maybe, yeah. yeah, I it's been, you know, that was successful. And, and I think there have been even more since then. Mm -hmm. Jean just did a, book, a, a young adult edition of the Rosa Parks book. So Jean, maybe a comic book is the next thing in your future. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> Somebody has to draw it. Julian did not draw it. He wrote, he wrote it, but you know, someone else drew it. Oh, oh, there it is. And there it is. Yeah, this is just for um, Well done, James. Thank you for that question. Uh, I had not heard of this. I had no knowledge of uh, uh, Julian Bond as a uh, author of a, a, a graphic uh, novel, I guess, or a comic book on Vietnam. Yes. Um, Jean, I'm sure that you you are well aware of this, and, and Pam too. But um, that it's not it's it's not unprecedented to have uh, a comic book associated with the movement because um, the Montgomery movement produced and the Fellowship of Reconciliation, um, one of the uh, the midwife organizations for the movement that Julian talks about, produced a comic book on the Montgomery movement, and of course, Dr. King. Uh, was the, um, the, 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 the main sort of protagonist of, of, of that comic book. But um, apparently that, that book has been translated, that comic book has been translated uh, to many languages all over the world. And a translation of that in Arabic was credited uh, during the, the Arab Spring of uh, 2011 uh, that uh, that the message of uh, the Montgomery movement and nonviolent direct action uh, actually, uh, you know, had played a part in the organizing of, of, of those protests. Okay, um, here's a question that's just come in. Uh, and I love these questions from people who uh, it, it, uh, it looks like um, took the course, uh, studied with yeah. Julian Bond. But uh, this is a question from Michael Schur. Julian used to call Black History Month his busy season. Uh, but he also said that people are too comfortable with knowing the history that they know and not going deeper and not applying it to the issues of today. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, Michael Schur wants to know uh, if this is something that I'm experiencing with, uh, with my uh, younger students. Um, I think, as, as I was saying before, that the students really, um, their knowledge of the movement doesn't really go beyond a, um, you know, a rudimentary knowledge of, of the sort of the common sense. Um, their exposure to Black history is usually limited to figures like Dr. King or Rosa Park, Parks. They often tell me uh, when I talk about Malcolm X or even Muhammad Ali, a figure like that. Uh, that they'd never heard of, their, their school had not told them about uh, Malcolm X. And you can kind of understand why, because Malcolm X certainly is a figure um, who pushes against the master narrative, pushes against this notion that American society um, is um, on this sort of steady and inevitable and unstoppable uh, course of reform and improvement and progress. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, students look at the past through the perspective of what's happening today. And they're looking at the civil rights movement uh, with a, a real uh, interest in the, the you know, issues of police brutality. Um, I, in, in, in some ways, the students who take my class are very, very self-selecting. Um, they, they're, they're taking the class out of a genuine interest, a desire to know more, a desire to sort of fill in the gaps of their, um, you know, their K-12 education. And so um, I, I, 
I sense a lot of interest and enthusiasm from, from, from my students. Okay, um, one more question has come in. Uh, and I, I, I guess I'm, you know, someone is bringing this question back. I, I may have missed it earlier in the queue. Uh, was, was, this, was the question from Pearl Early answered about the one, the greatest achievement of the movement and what were the failures of the movement, if I'm reading the question uh, correctly. And I think this is a, you know, an important question and a challenging question um, that, that any of us who, 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 who uh, teaches about the movement has to really sort of deal with. What were the successes and what were the failures of the civil rights movement? Um, Jean, would you like to? So one of the things I remember from the class is also um, about the Mississippi movement, right? And that one of the greatest achievements was the kind of breaking the back of fear um, and that how important that was. And I think we can see, you know, again, that we could see that being cyclical. And so I think part of what Black Lives Matter is doing again is to breaking sort of new areas of fear. Um, but that I think one of the great achievements, right, was, was that in some ways we're thinking about one of the real accomplishments of the Southern struggle, right, which was the, the variety of tools in the arsenal of white supremacy to silence, to silence people and then the kind of breaking open of that. Um, and and then with that, obviously, you know, the struggle for voting rights, the struggle for access to public assistance, this, you know, like the, the things that come off of that as well. Yeah, I mean, the greatest legislative achievements were clearly the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, and it's, it's not a coincidence that since Lyndon Johnson signed those acts, no Democratic presidential candidate has won the white vote in this country. And of course, we know, as I talked about before, what happened to the, to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and, I, I, and I think as far as failures, it may too harken back to what I said about economic disparities, because I think, uh, you know, SNCC sought to remove both the strictures uh, of race and the, and the structures in the society that, that created them, uh, and, then, and then some. And I think, it, you know, the, a lot of the strictures were successfully removed. And some of the things are, are unimaginable to students today. I mean, Julian's students used to say to him when he taught the boycott, well, I'd never go to the, I'd never go to the back of the bus. And, and they wouldn't now, and they wouldn't have to worry about being arrested or worse if they did. Um, but we were, the, the, the economic, particularly the economic structures, the structures were, were still, we're still working on and, and people in SNCC would, I think, concede that that was, uh, you know, one of, one of the unrealized uh, hopes of the movement. Yeah, and, and to that I, I would add that SNCC saw a direct connection between voting rights and political empowerment and economic empowerment. There was, you know, they were really kind of, uh, you know, one in the same, that you could not really um, advance economically without the right to vote and elect your own representatives and then, you know, make uh, change policy in ways that would be meaningful. Um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about leadership and how, um, you know, uh, Julian Bond's uh, lectures and, and, and now this wonderful book really challenged that narrative of, of charismatic leaders of, you know, I remember in the, the 1980s and 90s, you know, uh, which was a very sort of bleak period for civil rights with conservative administrations, you'd hear people sort of complaining that we don't have any leaders. Um, as if, you know, uh, we needed someone on the level of Dr. King. Of course, you had the Jesse Jackson uh, presidential campaigns and mobilizations around that. But, you know, it, it seemed 
that one of the issues that um, the book is dealing with is this question of not just leadership, but the role of black women in the movement as leaders, but also as really significant uh, contributors to you know, organizing in, in the movement. And I, I just wondered if you could comment on that. I, I, I just found uh, the discussions, the little biographical sketches of people like um, Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and, and, uh, and of course Rosa Parks to be, you know, uh, and, and Septima Clark to be really, really important and really revealing on that, on that particular issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are women all over the book, right? And if you change the way we think about where the movement comes from um, and you focus on how a mass movement is built at the, like you don't you don't build a mass movement by having somebody give like a great moving speech right you build a mass movement because people see themselves see the possibility for their own sort of action see the possibility for their own leadership um and certainly across the book there are so many women who are who are making that who are doing that work, who had been doing that work and who continue to step forward and, and keep doing it, right? And, and again, I think again and again, going back to this point we were talking about earlier, they start and then, then, then as things get in motion, what, like, then it changes what even that people are struggling for, right? I mean, one of the things that Julian drilled into us was that when the Montgomery bus boycott starts, they are not asking for full desegregation on the bus. In part because there had been the successful boycott in Baton Rouge that they learned from and Baton Rouge had gotten sort of more respectful first come first serve seating. And so when the Montgomery bus boycott starts, that's what they're asking for too. And we don't remember that because as they get in motion, as the repression against the boycott escalates, you see people then just be like, okay, no, we're gonna go for full desegregation. These people are you know, bothering us and they're not doing anything even knowing we're asking for this. So we're going, and I think that's partly because of the leadership, the steadfast leadership of women. And we see this in the book, in the chapter on the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, right? And they get to Atlantic City and they're offered this meager compromise and it's the women really first and foremost, who are like, we didn't come here for these two seats. We're not, we're not taking this compromise. And then, and they don't. Right, but that I think one of the things that the book does is absolutely, I mean, Julian did was to make sure we understood that, that really wide cast of leaders. Thank you. Um, well, I think I'm going to exercise my prerogative uh, to bring uh, Deborah McDowell into our discussion. Um, you know, I think we've been getting I, I really want to thank my fellow panelists for uh, the energy and insight that they're bringing to the discussion. And um, and and Deborah, was there something that you wanted to uh, to 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 raise? Okay, um, maybe uh, Deborah will will. Uh, uh, I was muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I was muted and my camera was off. I didn't think my camera should be on when I wasn't speaking so that people could focus on you all. But um, the one thing I would say is that when Pam suggested that we are keeping Julian Bond's legacy, that is very true. And so we want to remind people of um, an annual event we host at the Woodson Institute called Transcribe Bond, where we are working uh, literally to transcribe the papers in UVA special collections and that will proceed again. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get information about that. And we're very happy that we recently received a grant from the NHPRC uh, to assist us with advancing that project, which we've been engaged with, with the help of student interns now for about five years. Um, and so it's a wonderful crowdsource event, uh, event that involves the community. Uh, we could not do it last uh, August because of COVID, but with any luck, we will resume 
I guess the only other thing I would say about what that transcription experience has taught me, I am not an historian by training, um, but what it has taught me along with the student interns with whom James and I have been working, uh, and that is um, many of the speeches, and we're starting there, that Julian gave in the 70s in particular, you read today and they resonate very powerfully. It is as if they could have been written in 2020, 2021. They lose absolutely none of their resonance or their implications for contemporary urgencies, especially as regards inequality, social injustice, um, et cetera. So I just thought I wanted to share with the audience one uh, bit because what we do in the lead up to the Transcribathon is start giving our followers on social media little, bitty, little tidbits of what Julian wrote. And this is from a 1975 speech. Uh, it goes, we must set new goals for those who rule us. And I wanted to uh, read this in light of what happened uh, on January 6th, in light of the recent election, et cetera. So we must set new goals for those who rule us. We must begin now to create a world in which privilege is passed to the many and not reserved for the few, where goods and services are shared by all. What would such a world provide? That world would provide income and wealth distribution through a tax structure that reduces the disparity between the needy and the greedy. The elimination of poverty through a program of full employment supplemented by a negative income tax for workers earning on the margin. And he goes on in, these, in this way, you get a sense of, uh, again, what are we talking about right now? Raising the federal minimum wage, right? Uh, we should be talking far more than we do about poverty. Uh, we should be holding our leaders uh, <laughs> to account. Julian in 1975 is writing this speech which he could deliver or someone could deliver on his behalf today. So um, that is a long-winded way of saying, among the many things we have to cherish uh, and celebrate about Julian Bond and Pam and Jean. Jeannie, you never corrected me. I've been mispronouncing your name forever. I've been calling you Jeannie. <laughs> and you never corrected me. <laughs> so I'm sorry uh, no, no, that no. Pam and Jean have captured so beautifully um, uh, in this book is the, the value that lives long after people who are invested in doing the work that Julian did, that work lives on uh, when they have left the physical plane. And so, um, it's just been a delight for me to listen to this conversation and to share, have you share with audiences um, what Julian Bunn was, but also what he is. When we named our symposium of 2016, Keep the Movement Coming On, which was an excerpt from a speech that Julian gave, it's that everything we read in this book really urges us to keep the movement coming on, right? Uh, not to let that legacy, that really rich legacy um, die out. And I don't think there's a chance of that happening as long as Pam and Jean and other scholars um, and activists and teachers of the civil rights movement um, remain on the case. So thank you. I'm sorry I went on for so long. Oh no, that, that that's thank that's, you. That's all right, thank, thank you, Deborah. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, and I just want to assure people who are asking that this session has been recorded, and, and you should be able to access it with from the uh, Carter G. Woodson uh, Institute website. But one another question has come in, and I think it's a really good note to end on. It's a very important question from Allison Richards, 
Was there any other African-American leader from the 1960s who so closely tied the black civil rights movement to the LGBTQ plus movement? Mm. This seemed to be an especially, uh, uh, this, well, this seemed to apply especially to Julian. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be important. Yeah. And you no, I, I, think, I think you probably could say that Julian was uh, the, the, the premier national black leader uh, in support of gay rights in general and marriage equality in, in particular. And, and that, that became one of uh, his main issues uh, in the last decade of his life. And he certainly was the one responsible for the NAACP having passed a board, having passed a resolution almost unanimously. I think only two out of 64 voted against marriage equality. Uh, and there was research done after that indicating that that was more important in terms of shaping the views of the black community at large, even than uh, President Obama's endorsement of marriage equality. So it was an important part of Julian's activism. Well, thank you. To, well, we're, we're really at the end of our time. So I just want to thank our uh, uh, panelists for being with us today for editing this wonderful book, Julian Bond, Time to Teach, Julian Bond's Time to Teach, a uh, History of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And, um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your insights and, and uh, about Julian Bond and his legacy. Um, Deborah, your point about his speeches from the 1970s speaking to us today, I think is incredibly apt. And I think of Julian Bond's uh, uh, book, A Time to Speak, A Time to Act, which uh, I think should, uh, should also be uh, published, should be reprinted as it is, I think, a primary source from the period. So thank you. Uh, oh, Kevin, one last thing. If yeah. I could encourage those who are still in the audience, visit your local independent bookstores. When we advertise this event over social media, we gave examples of bookstores. If you don't have the book, we encourage you to get it and to get it from any independent bookstore in your area. For us, um, a New Dominion Bookshop is a great place for those of us in Charlottesville. If you're in California, Marcus Books, but you know where your independent bookstores are because there are so few. <laughs> so we would urge you to purchase Julian Bond's A Time to Teach from your local independent bookstore. I second that. And if you don't see it on the shelf, order it. <laughs> so thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Good thank night. you. Good night. Thank everyone who uh, who attended and uh, have a good evening. Good evening.